the title of my sermon this morning is A Day in the Life of a Christian. And you notice there I am emphasizing Christ. And so this is part two. We started, there are about 12 things in chapter five that Jesus did or um, that happened to Jesus um, and that we can use as a role model. As Christians, things that we are to emulate in Christ. I was thinking about a routine day in my life, and that is modified. My, my routine is correlated with my maturity, um, and that is uh, a thing that I did not have when I was young. I know when I was in college, I got into the habit of um, I would sleep in whatever I, you know, as I got experience in college, I put my classes late, I scheduled them later and later in the morning or early afternoon so that I could sleep right up till class time. And I would, I would um, dress in the clothes that I wanted to wear to class, which was usually warm up clothes, a sweatshirt and warm up pants. And I would set my alarm clock five minutes if I had a 10 o'clock class, I would set my clock 9.55, and I would jump up, grab my book bag, and start flying. This is NC State. I lived in Brigal dorm, uh, uh, um, McKinley, and I went to the food science building, which was right across the gully. I'm sure they've done something like put a super highway in there now, but, but I ran through the woods, and I would plop down in the back of class. That was kind of my routine, and, and as far as food, I would gorge myself. I, you know, I would eat whatever I could get hold of. And so there really wasn't a routine other than sleep. Go to bed as late as you can, sleep as late as you can, eat whatever you can get hold of. Then as I, I went on, I got a job as a school teacher, one of my early jobs, and I got better. Um, I, I did go to bed. I started valuing going to bed when I had to get up early every morning. Uh, and then I got it to about 15 minutes. I would get up about 15 minutes before I went out the door. And that was just enough time to take a shower, dress, get to the car, get to school. Uh, and my eating got a little bit more uniform uh, at that time, but it was still kind of all over the place. And that's why I've always, all my life, I'll, you know, I'll gain 40 pounds and then I'll lose 40 pounds. And it's because my routine was not good. I, you know. Now I get up and I sit in my easy chair and drink coffee. And I have a, at least 30 minutes every day where I'm just sitting still, kind of letting the day, kind of waking up, letting the day come to me. Um, I am very regimented. It's usually, it's usually about an hour. I leave about an hour after I get up. Um, sometimes uh, when I have to go to Black Mountain, I get up early. I haven't, my class starts at 8 o'clock. I get up there at 7.30. So, so I only have about a 40 minute on, on Tuesdays and Thursdays during the school year. My eating is very regimented um, these days. I, I have a, a wonderful wife um, who has a very sore throat today, by the way. And I try, thought about forcing her to come just so we could make fun of her squeaking. Uh, she tried to talk, but anyway, she she gives me a a lunchbox full of food, and that's what I eat. And it's it's basically the same thing. It's very healthy. Um, up through supper, that's what I eat, and then I go home. And she gives me some supper. Um, and and now the thing that is most different from the other days, part of my routine, is I I go to bed at about the same time every day. I go to bed about the same time, and I get up about the same time every day. Uh, so much more regimented as I've matured. So we're going to look today at eight more things. We looked at four two weeks ago, things of a, we'll say a routine day. I'm sure all these things did not happen in one day. I'm sure these are a collection of things. Uh, but we're going to look at things that Jesus did. And, and our goal here is to copy Jesus, is to approach these things in a way um, to kind of learn from his modeling. So first, Jesus was misunderstood, and this happens a lot in the Gospels. In Luke chapter 5, verse 21, we'll pick up. It says, And the scribes 
And the Pharisees began to reason as they listened to him. Now, you saw from the opening screen, this is the incidents where uh, Jesus was talking in a house and they let down a, a crippled man in bed from the roof and he healed him. Uh, the Pharisees began to reason saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Because Jesus forgave his sins. Who can forgive sins but God alone? These critics did not fathom. They, you know, they thought, obviously, they thought of Jesus as a human being. And they looked at the human being saying, I forgive your sins. And, you know, they couldn't fathom how Jesus, who seemed only human to them, could do what only God could do, forgive sins. And, you know, if one of us, it's easy to criticize the Pharisees. They kind of get a bad rap in the Gospels. We might do the same thing. If I began telling people that their sins are forgiven, that's not biblical. We're, we're not in a place to forgive other people's sins. Uh, but what is interesting to me is that when Jesus is misunderstood, he relies on doctrine. He relies on doctrine. He falls back on biblical doctrine. Okay. You know what? I got my, sc my screens out of order. Here is my in college, young man, and then today. There's the thing. So my apologies for that. What is doctrine? Simply put, doctrine is an organized statement of what is believed. And so, you know, an example would be, and this is typical of a conversation with Todd. I'll say, Todd, what did you work on this week? Well, I was looking at the World War II, the shift in naval doctrine for the United States. And doctrine is simply the organized plan of what, they be, be, what their philosophy, what their belief was about what they should do uh, in time of war if Japan attacked or whatever in World War II. But we, we have an organized doctrine, and these are statements of what the Bible is saying. Um, it's not exactly, it, it is a doctrinal statement, the Baptist faith and message which is a very good, if you have not read the Baptist Faith and Message recently, I, I encourage you to. And it states simply what Southern Baptists believe that the Bible says. And then it gives all the scriptures. And so you read the statement, and then you can go down and read the scriptures and see if, if you're Southern Baptist or not. Uh, or if you agree with those statements. So for example, the gospel is an organized statement of belief that is the central belief. If we only could keep one, it would be the gospel. And that is that we are sinful, and that sin separates us from God. So each human is not able to decide, okay, God, let's be friends now, because the sin separates them. It is the belief that God became the man Jesus, walked on earth, a real person, historical person, and that he lived his own life without sin, because he did that, he was able to go to the cross and die in the place of the whole world, it says in, in 2 John 2, 2, or 1 John 2, 2, sorry. Uh, and if you believe that Jesus died for your sins and that you need that, that you're sinful and need that, he will take those sins away. And it, you, then you confess him as Lord and live your life for him. That's our central doctrine. Uh, of evangelical Christianity. What separates people's doctrine most of the time is where they get their information from that they base their beliefs on. So everybody, we are made in the image of God. All people are theologians. We all have thoughts about God. Everybody does. Now some people fight against it, but made in the image of God, we have thoughts about God. What, where do you get that, the information that you make up your doctrine from differentiates the doctrine. And if you're getting it from the Bible, what I have found in my studies, people that value the Bible as the inspiration of God, as I do, have basically the same doctrine. We might disagree on a couple little fine points, but we're going to believe the same thing because we have the same source of information. Now, if you're getting your information, and, and this used to be, that's one reason the Bible Belt used to be a lot bigger, is because there wasn't a ton of sources 
for doctrine about God when many of you were young. As we've got more and more information availability, we have greater divergence of doctrines. And so now you can find people who will suggest notions about God that do not match biblical doctrine. That's why I say every, every week, value the Bible, study the Bible, read the Bible, know about the Bible, um, because the Bible is what God wants us to know about himself. Um, otherwise, you are casting a God. You are making up a God, in my opinion. If you go outside of the Bible, you're making up your own God. And, you know, it's, it's fascinating. People, lots of people, people have always done that. And what is interesting about it is when you start making up a God, that God thinks a lot like you do. And so that is very empowering, you know, I guess, I suppose, to people because God agrees with them. I'll tell you what, God don't agree with everything. <laughs> everything that I think. I, I, it's hard for me to study for a lesson or a sermon and not find out that I'm wrong about something. Um, and most people don't like that. So they find sources of information or people that agree with them. And that's, that's kind of a malfunction in our society now is that people are only looking for information sources from people that they agree with, or that agree with them. It makes you feel very important, but it doesn't make you right. So, anyway, stick with the Bible. As evangelical Christians, we are committed to the orthodox canon of Scripture. That's the 66 books uh, agreed upon for for. 1700 years um, as the 66 Bible, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament um, as our source for doctrine. And, and I stake my life, my eternal life on the fact that I think that I am in agreement with what Jesus would have taught. Though I have more New Testament than he did, so I'm fortunate in that. But as far as the Old Testament and the purpose of his existence and, and all that, um, we agree, I think. Doctrine is very important. I was able to get saved without a full knowledge of what I believe. That's very important. Salvation is not difficult. God did not make you have to memorize the Bible and be able to outline doctrines, the big doctrines, in order to get saved. It's, it's simple. I trust Jesus. Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me for my sins, save me, die in my place, be my Lord. That's it. But not knowing doctrine, not knowing the Bible, I made a lot of mistakes. I pushed, this is the thing that makes me really weep, is in my lack of biblical like acumen, I would act in a way that would push people away from Jesus. Um, I spent a lot of time backslidden because I was not, um, I did not know the Bible and doctrine well. Um, when we don't know the real truth, we usually make up our own truths. And that's fine. I mean, I guess that makes people feel good, but that's not going to move you towards God or really help you in your own life a ton. So back to the scribes and Pharisees, I, I'm a little bit forgiving of them. Um, they saw Jesus as a man. They spoke in ignorance. They spoke as defenders of Judaism, defenders of their tradition. You know, you get with somebody, if you've grown up Southern Baptist and you get with somebody that's something else and they start talking about stuff that kind of rubs a Baptist the wrong way, you, you, we usually go in the same way. Well, this, this is what we believe and so forth. So, they did not realize, they were ignorant of the fact that they were arguing with God. God had become a man and was standing right there in front of them, and they were arguing with him and, and casting shadows on him. Uh, and it's important that we have the full canon of Scripture. It's important for me to be honest with you, ignorance will not work on Judgment Day. They'll be, just like, you know, if you go to the judge, back me up on this, Taylor, and you say, I didn't realize it was 55 there. You know, I, I thought it was 95. The ignorance is no excuse. Neither Taylor 
nor the judge will give you grace for, for that. Hopefully. Well, in this world, I don't know, but they're not supposed to. But I'll guarantee you, one thing I can guarantee you on Judgment Day when you stand before God, you say, well, you know, I didn't read that verse, Lord. It ain't going to help you. It ain't going to help you. Uh, Paul wrote this in his letter to the Romans. He says, for since the world was created, this is Romans chapter 1, verse 20, men have seen the earth and sky. Just looking around in the world through, through all God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities. Paul is saying everybody has a concept of God. We were created. We have a concept of the creator his eternal power, divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Only human will, which is born with a sin nature, a defiant sin nature, only that defiant will will keep us from God. And we all have the defiant sin nature. Everybody should have a relationship with God. We were created to have a relationship with God. We shut him out. Our job as Christians, one of our main jobs as we walk this world, is to fight ignorance of salvation. And we've got to do that in every way. Holistic approach in the way we act, the way we talk, tell, looking for opportunities to tell the truth. Everything we do, we are to fight ignorance that people have of biblical salvation. So we are to trust the Bible, as it says in Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, your own theology, doctrine. In all your ways, acknowledge God, and he will direct your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And that's what Jesus did. Next, Jesus relied not only on doctrine, but he relied on the power of God in his actions. Um, he wasn't running on his own motor, but the, the power of God in his actions. Verses 24 and 25. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. I'm going to give you a little demonstration, he said. He said to the man that was paralyzed, that was lying on the bed, I say to you, arise and take up your bed. So they were questioning his ability to forgive sins. He tells the man, get up and go to your house. Immediately, that man rose before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Now, we can't. Um, the Bible says that if you have enough faith, that we could do this also. Um, and so I'm still a work in progress. So I don't want to say we can't do this. This is an extraordinary case of relying on the power. We can do the same thing. Uh, we are to do the same thing in all that we do, relying on God to do his will, and we act as his agents. Um, so looking at this, a couple points. Jesus things that we can do, we can focus attention on God as Jesus did. Uh, one, a really good scripture is Philippians 2, 5 through 8. You must have the same attitude as Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he didn't think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, divine powers, omnipresence, omniscience, all that, he took a humble position as a slave and was born as a human being. When he came in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. So Jesus focused attention on God. Jesus' life applied scripture. So everything he did was an application of scripture. And you got to know scripture in order to apply it. Jesus demonstrated doctrine. He didn't just speak beliefs, but he demonstrated those beliefs. Those two are kind of the same, saying the same thing in a different way. Jesus' actions revealed him as Messiah. As he went forth and as he healed, it became obvious that he was the Messiah. Now, we, we're not the Messiah 
But our actions and our words should reveal that we believe Jesus as the Messiah. That is, the, that is our power source. We can't cons- forgive sins as Jesus did, but we can point people to the gospel that, will, that is the ultimate forgiveness of sin. Jesus brings glory to God. In verse 26, uh, the people were all amazed. They glorified God and were filled with fear. That is that respectful fear. Uh, God is God and I am not. Saying, we have seen strange things today. For the Christian, all we do every day, all day, should bring glory to God. That's our goal to bring all our actions and words into captivity to God's glory. So you ask yourself, does this bring glory to God? And if it doesn't, you shouldn't do it. That should be your test. Should I do this or not? So let me give you a pop quiz. Everybody put on your thinking cap. Can the following things bring glory to Jesus? Eating breakfast. Well, we, yes, we are, you know, go back and look at Genesis chapter 1. We, we've got to eat. God gave us hunger. We have to have energy. And we should think, we should, it is all in the way that we think about eating breakfast, whether it gives glory to God or not. Do I do this to strengthen myself so I can live before God, live my life? What about driving your car? Can that glorify God? It can, we know that it cannot glorify God sometimes. And so we've got to, you know, and that's not a thing you can wait till that person cuts you off to decide, you know what, should I glorify God here or should I let that person know that I'm displeased? It, it's a process, isn't it? Every day we need to practice an attitude that is pleasing to God in something like driving a car. But that... So that on that time that we're given the opportunity to not glorify God, we choose to instantly. What about the clothes we wear? Well, certainly, I mean, this is not saying that we got to wear a suit or we got to dress like we do on Sunday every day of the week, but we can certainly wear clothes that dishonor God. Um, And so, again, it's a process thinking about how our actions affect the world around us. Going to work, I think very much what we do all day long uh, should be things that that add to our life positively, that please God. God wants us to be able to to do the things in our life. Going shopping, certainly. Um, I'll tell you what, I have to, I, I get to a parking lot and I look and see how many people are in the store I need to go to and sometimes it's so full, I'm like, okay, Sarah, let's say a prayer that we don't get agitated in here. And that's part of a frame of mind. Because I'll tell you what, there's been a change in society. And I don't want to take my sermon in a different direction right quick. When I went to California, one of the first things I noticed, California used to be many years ahead of us philosophically, like you can go to California and see what we're going to be doing. And it used to be 10 years, but now it's in about 15 minutes. But when I got to California, the first thing I noticed is that old people were rude. And they dressed younger than they were supposed to in California. They'd go in the grocery store, they'd cut you off, try to beat you to the spot. I'm like, you're an old person. I was going to wait on you. Slow down. Well... Have you been in the grocery store lately? Watch out for John Hilker, I'll just tell you that. <laughs> um, but it was a, that's a change in our society. You know, there used to be a dignity to getting on. Now they're trying to run you into the wall with the thing. And so anyway, again, I don't want to take my sermon somewhere else. I have to often pray before I go into a store, if, I, if it's rocking, so that I can be calm. And then I can stand away and I can stand for people to cut me off and be okay with it and not being, because I tell you what, I've been working, God's been working on me 57 years. I can throw it all away in about two seconds if somebody makes me mad. Uh, and, And we can't do that. We can't do that. 
So we want to go shopping in a way that brings glory to God, but that takes some effort, doesn't it? Some intentionality. Cleaning house, certainly, that can glorify God. Um, and I could speak about each one of these, the way we speak to people, so much. I'll tell you what, the Bible is loaded with, whenever people in the Old Testament meet God face to face, they begin worrying about what they say, what they've said. Does what you say, the way you speak to people, bring glory to God or this unglory, de-glory? How do you say it, Todd? Not glory. Shame. Sleeping, the way we sleep. I think, I think the way we sleep, the pattern of sleeping. Um, what about reading the Bible? Certainly reading the Bible can bring glory to God. Loving others. I'm giving you easy ones. Okay, now I'm going to get a little bit more challenging. Can our entertainment bring glory to God? I think it can, but again, it takes a little preparation, a little intentionality. We all know that our entertainment can bring shame to God and dishonor. And, you know, that we all know that we can have a Christian life that is a little bit separate from our entertainment life. And so... That one's a little bit more tricky. We have to be intentional that our entertainment brings glory to God. And I will say, I was gonna, I've announced it to Charlie, but um, I no longer pull for the Los Angeles Dodgers. I've dropped them. Um, they, they chose to honor people that were anti-Christian publicly, uh, the people that were extremely publicly anti-Christian and they chose to give, give them an award. And, and I knew that they were going to do it. They did it on June 16th. And I, it, um, I just, I was in this gray area. I didn't know what to do. I was so perplexed about it. And, I, and I, it just kind of stalled me. And I got up the next morning and they had gone ahead and given this award. And I said, I can't be a fan of them anymore because I am talking one story on Sunday. And I am talking another story the rest of the week if I stay with this team. And so they're gone. I, I don't know. I don't know about the Braves. The Braves are next in line. I don't know. That, that feels like such a betrayal. So we'll see. We'll see. It might do me good to not have a baseball team, honestly. Um, but that's a lot of entertainment. I would get up every morning. For eight, nine months a year, I could get up every morning and look at the score. And I love the statistics. I look at the statistics and I see, you know, how it affect Kershaw's ERA and all that. And that's gone. And so I, are we on, are we tracking here? Entertainment is an important part of how we bring glory to God or not. And I put I put one in here. Can you hate your neighbor in a way that glorifies God? There's no way. Okay. And so you've got to really examine your heart. Do I have hatred? And there is no part for hatred uh, that brings glory to God. Except hating sin, I guess. I guess we can hate sin. Jesus' uh, disciples, other people. So in verse 27, after these things, he went out, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he left all and rose up and followed him. We'll talk a little bit next week about a tax collector and, and all the implications. That's, it was a possession, uh, profession that was considered unclean and sinful. Just You can't be a righteous tax collector um, in the idea here. So Jesus called him out of that profession, and he left all and followed Jesus. And the lesson for us is that we have to always look to the next generation uh, as believers. Always be mindful of the next generation and teaching them doctrine and helping them in their walk, in their pathway, to looking to disciple those. Once you have gotten to a certain level of maturity as a Christian, you need to look to the next generation. Number nine, Jesus ministers to real people. So... Uh, Levi gave him a great feast at his house and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with him. The Pharisees call them sinners. Uh, and so Jesus 
was not mindful of his status. Um, he was the things that make humans attractive to people. Jesus was not worried about that. He was worried about, again, the power of God and glorifying God. And so he ministered to the people that were there. He interacted with those people. Um, so the Pharisees saw that, and their scribes and Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And so it does point out that it's not good to live in a bubble with no criticism. Um, there's always going to be some. You need to be wary of people who are always on you, but don't try to create a world where nobody ever finds fault in what you do. The fact is you cannot live the Christian life and not offend people in the world. So don't try to live in total avoidance of of criticism, but you know, be, be mindful of those who are on you all the time. So Jesus responds to the Pharisees and the scribes, their criticism, with, with I think a mission statement, verses 31, 32. Jesus answered and said, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, people of faith, people who love God, but sinners to repentance. That was ultimate, Jesus' ultimate purpose. Now his immediate purpose, he was a reformer of the Jewish religion. Um, they had drifted away, the Jewish religion had drifted away from the Old Testament. And we see today, they're just, modern Judaism is just a very distant shadow of, of Old Testament religion. Uh, they've, they've gone far afield from what the Bible says. Um, and they had begun that drift before Jesus. But his ultimate purpose is right here, to call the lost, to call the sinner to God. If you wrote out a mission statement today, what would it be? Now, I, I put some lines. If you've got a bulletin insert, uh, a sermon guide, I put a couple of lines. Maybe try out writing a mission statement. What is your mission? And... If you say, I don't know, I don't know what my purpose is, then it is not God who has the problem. It is you. Everybody should have a mission. Because if you don't have a mission, you're just walking aimlessly in this world. What is your mission? So Jesus scrutinized, number 11, he scrutinized religious practice. Jesus was pretty hard on religious people. Then they said to him, why did your disciples, um, the disciples of John, comparing him to his cousin, why do they fast often and make prayers? You know, in a very public, you, everybody knows you're fasting. You put on sackcloth, you put on burlap sack, and, and very demonstrative that you are in a time of fasting and religious practice. And likewise, those of the Pharisees, the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. They don't seem to be, they don't seem to be demonstrating their religiousness. And I say be mindful and respectful of religiousness. It's important. I mean, religion is what we can see of people's faith often. Uh, but remember that the way we act when we're here together is a secondary purpose in our life. Your primary pur purpose is to represent Christ when you're not here. Amen. And so our purpose in meeting on Sunday and Wednesday is to get, get charged up for the rest of the time. Not, not the way we act here. Y'all act so good at church. I, I enjoy interacting with you. I enjoy you when I see you outside of church. But the way we act here at church is a secondary purpose. Uh, our primary purchase, purpose is what we do on Monday morning. Respect, respect of religion does not mean that you love God. But, on the other hand, those who are disrespectful of religion, it's usually a sign that you think more of yourself, or you think yourself more important than God. I mean, it's uh, people that are disrespectful to religious people, they think that they're, that they're more important than God. Or they are their own God. 
the last thing today in chapter 5, Jesus emphasizes that it is about relationship rather than practice, religion. And he said to them, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? That is a time of celebration when the bridegroom is here, a time of interaction, a time of relationship. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and they will fast in those days. So this is kind of a, a parable or a metaphor uh, for his life. A couple notes on that. Jesus emphasized personal relationship. And so ultimately, if you are a believer, you have a personal relationship with Jesus um, and thus with God. And that is that is the core of being a Christian, not what church you go to. Jesus is our <clears throat> personal Savior. He is not, he died to make salvation available to the whole world, but true salvation is a you and Jesus center stage and everything else disappears. And it is a personal thing between each of us and Jesus. Jesus was forecasting his death in this, his resurrection and his ascension into heaven. Jesus is emphasizing the fact that we believers must carry on his mission once he's gone. And so uh, reiterating the points of this sermon, the, the eight um, happenings and uh, what we should do when we are misunderstood we should rely on doctrine. We should clean up and communicate what it is that we truly believe and that it is from the Bible, not from us. We need to rely on God's power when we are in, especially in difficult situations and not our own to fix everything. We are to live lives that bring glory to God every day, all the time. We are to disciple others as we go through this life. Discipling means teaching doctrine, modeling doctrine, spending times. And again, that relationship is in that discipleship. We are to minister to real people, not just people who think like us, uh, not just people who come to our church. We are, our ministry is to be all the people we meet all the time. Uh, live your mission statement. Know what you're doing, why you're here, uh, and have that as a focus point as you get up and go about each day. Be respectful of religion. Uh, you know, have, have respect that, you know, a Muslim, Buddhist, Mormon, they believe what they believe just as much as we believe and often more. So be respectful of that, but know and emphasize that your personal relationship with God is the most important thing. And those other religions are nice for religion, I guess, but that will not, nothing but a personal relationship with Jesus uh, will get us to God, will get us to eternity uh, in glory. And I think that says it all. Let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your model. Help us to live our lives each day in a way that reflects you. And Lord, if there's anyone listening that has never asked you into their heart, may it be to today, Lord. Uh, may it be today that they accept you as Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.